Islam in the artistic developments of peninsular and viceregal societies. Her dissertation looked at the question of so-called mudejar art in viceregal societies in the Americas. Um, and she's also published extensively on uh, textiles in the Iberian Peninsula, and that's what we'll get to hear from her today. Um, her work has been funded by the Crest Foundation, the Fulbright Garcia Robles Commission, and the Society of Architectural Historians, among others. And uh, the work that she's going to be presenting to us today is um, with the support of the Fondation Max von Bersham. Um, she is directing the Medieval Textiles in Iberia Research Project, and we're going to get to see a little bit of the results of that research project. Um, her paper is entitled, 12th Century Textiles in Iberia at the Crossroads of Commerce and Ritual. Please join me in welcoming back. <laughs> it's me, yay. All right. I hope to have more control of the visual material <laughs> in this one. <laughs> Let's see what I can do. Is, is it OK if I move this little guy? I guess it is. So the talk that I am going to give uh, today is a bit different uh, to what you have heard already. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about objects, uh, and I am unable at present to give a linear development of anything. It's how it is. Uh, so what I've done is I, I'm, I've started backwards. I'm, I'm kind of starting in the 19th century, actually in the 20th century, and moving myself back towards the 12th century. And uh, in between, uh, going back and forth to the 19th century quite often. And, and this is purposeful. It's um, hopefully you'll get a sense of the kinds of things that we have to do or, or how some of the, the nuggets of information come out of very strange sources and we have to follow them and track them in different ways. Um, some of the descriptions that I'm going to you know, give to you today are 16th century or 15th century descriptions. Uh, and, and so just to help us reconstruct some sense of ritual or the impact, the visual impact of these objects, right? And, and hopefully by the time we get to the 12th century, you, you have an idea, right? Of of the kind of environment or an approximation into the kind of environment that, that we're trying to reconstruct. So I would like to thank Abby Krasner Balvalip for the invitation to be here today. Very, very thankful. The context of this symposium really does provide an ideal vehicle and an audience to present this new material. In this talk, I will focus on a few case studies that are the product of the first year of large-scale work of the research program Medieval Textiles in Iberia and the Mediterranean that um, you just heard about a little bit, which I am directing along with a team of academics and museum conservation specialists. Uh, the team is uh, made up of uh, his art historian Laura Rodriguez Peinado at the Universidad Complutense, museum curator Ana Cabrera La Fuente, uh, now a fellow, a Marie Curie fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and Dr. Enrique Parra, uh, a conservation scientist currently at the Instituto de Conservación del Patrimonio Español in Madrid. The aim of this effort is a comprehensive reassessment of luxury textiles from the 10th to the 16th centuries through a series of interdisciplinary and scientific studies that will guide the study of medieval textiles in Iberia beyond the constraints of formal analysis, nationalist discourses, and geographical borders. Uh, I think you've heard a little bit about that kind of effort already from both Avi and Juan Carlos. So this is a, an attempt to do that, but for objects. The guiding principle of our work is to basically question everything and to do so from multiple perspectives and from multiple disciplines, including the scientific. Today, I would like to direct your attention to cases that speak of the combination of commercial, liturgical, and sensory dimensions behind the uses of medieval textiles in the Iberian Peninsula. But first, I think it's useful to establish the historiographical foundation uh, whose problems we have been dragging for more than a century, and they are complex. 
The traditional approach to the study of medieval textiles in the Iberian Peninsula has upheld with certainty and has thus generated truths by repetition, right? Write the same thing about the same textiles until there's nothing else to say because why bother? Um, and so these truths go something like this, right? That an overwhelming majority of the extant objects found in Iberian context was woven in the peninsula in Al-Andalus on the other side of the frontier. That these were inherently exotic and foreign objects, marks of otherness. We often see, even in contemporary writings on the subject, our kings, their textiles, right? Which in turn, third, identifies the taste for and use of these objects as part of a process of appropriation and looting hallmarks of Christian dominance as the ascendancy of the northern Iberian kingdoms gained impetus. The next steps in the narrative maintain that Muslim hands wove and that Christian bodies consumed passively, that technical sophistication derived from Muslim labor in Muslim territories while folkloric or popular or less appealing products reflect mudejar hands, as we mentioned mudejares, were conquered Muslims who lived in Christian jurisdictions. These presumptions are deeply problematic because they make no distinctions between coveted and refined items of trade and exotic indications of otherness. They conflate the terms foreign and exotic, which denote amazement driven by a lack of familiarity, right, with refined and coveted, which indicate appreciation and desirability based on discernment, which is based on knowledge. The, they certainly do not uh, acknowledge the consumer's ability to transform desirable items of trade into local or traditional vocabularies. I always bring a contemporary parallel to illustrate this kind of uh, issue outlined above. So indulge me here in a little excursion into the 21st century. Today, an astounding 40% of Japanese households and 94% of Tokyo women own at least one Louis Vuitton luxury item. <laughs> Yet we would be hard pressed to call nearly half of the population of Japan, of Japan Frenchified. To the contrary, we recognize the power of Asian markets in the transformation of European luxury br brands and the global economy, as well as the specific cultural associations generated by their presence in various Asian societies. consumption patterns and the generation of a luxury-based symbolic visual vocabulary in urban China, for instance, has been the object of a lot of academic attention recently. So it is clear to me that a methodological, methodological or theoretical alternative is needed for the medieval period, and it's one that is based on this kind of issues, one that has to take into account complexity, right? And, and complexity is the choice somebody makes and how you activate that choice and release it into your world. The traditional approach stands in opposition to an irre uh, irrefutable wealth of historical evidence. From cross-Mediterranean commercial records to local parish documentation and literary sources, the map of trade in and out of Iberia and throughout the Mediterranean is intricate in the extreme and it had textiles near the center. Textile nomenclature in historical and literary sources also speak of a remarkable geographic diversity. Yet the rigidity that we have assigned to the Andalusi Christian frontiers, the focus that we have placed on religious difference, as well as the labels that we have affixed to the objects, terms like Hispano-Muslim, Taifa, Mudejar, etc., have not let us see the forest for the trees. For instance, we know that Arabized Christians, or those Mozarabs, right, that Juan Carlos was talking about earlier, uh, form part of the weaving textile workshops that were active in the Royal Tiraz manufacture in Cordoba. And that when the caliphate dissolved in 1013, they promptly took up shop, not in the big Christian cities in the north, but in frontier areas where they could meet the growing demand most easily. The Leonese town of Pajareros is mentioned in historical sources, 
where these people are labeled Mozárabes de Rex Tiraceros, meaning that they settled in areas under the direct control of the crown, the realengo, rather than the nobility, the señorío, to maximize benefits and guarantee protection. And this is significant because it offers evidence of the deliberate and pragmatic resettlement of a very, very refinedly skilled and cross-confessional labor following not a religious crusade, but market demands. They were following the money. So was the king when he took them in. As a, as a starting point of my research, uh, you know, we have decided to do away with old labels and preconceived notions and chosen to start anew from the perspective of the materiality and the consumption of medieval material culture. We do not use terms at all, such as taifa, textile, or almoravid, you know, embroidery, things like that. We simply say things like, uh, super basic, the black and white coat in Roda, you know, when we pin it to the place where it came from. In our project, materiality is conceived as both the material conditions of production, that is the physical nature of the object, and the multiple relationships forged between them and their social worlds. We're very interested in exploring medieval consumer culture or consumer behavior through patterns of textile use. The emphasis on the concept of material culture and its systems of exchange and transformation opens a discussion to the exploration of medieval Iberian cultural values and getting at specificity, at what makes these objects function successfully within their context. And not a generic label such as Christian allows us to approximate more accurately the cultural worlds where they functioned. And that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do. Another objective is to elucidate the place of Iberia's textile manufacture within Mediterranean economic and commercial histories, as well as in relation to the greater distribution of textiles and raw materials within the Iberian Peninsula, across the Mediterranean and beyond. But this is a subject for another talk altogether. We also seek to recognize and explore the multiplicity of Iberian contexts through which the textiles moved and settled, and ultimately the specificity of their cultural meanings. Highlighting the, highlighting the vital role of sumptuous textiles in the production of medieval Iberian cultural identities. It is a central principle of this effort to look both inside and outside of the Iberian Peninsula and certainly well beyond the Christian-Muslim divide to refocus the lens through which we view these objects. We consider buildings, objects, and bodies, and not to mention, of course, the beliefs, the ideas, and the modes of transmission of taste and of technical knowledge, which provide a context for the uses and meanings of medieval textiles. Without this comprehensive historical and theoretical apparatus, we are simply left with a story of Mediterranean connectivity that does not move us far enough beyond the obvious. Something comes out of Baghdad and is found in Spain. You know, we need more than that. In addition to the greater objectives that I just outlined, the research program also is busy laying groundwork. We are completing an Arabic epigraphic corpus of extant textiles in collections across the United States and Europe. We're building an extensive and eventually publicly accessible database of objects currently housed in museums, church treasuries, and private collections, many of them of very difficult access and rarely ever published. And lastly, as you will see, uh, doing a lot of detective work along the way uh, on the long overdue reevaluation of 19th and early 20th century textile collecting practices and their influence upon the field of medieval Iberian studies. This is actually where we have found some of the most interesting leads, actually, for our work. So I'll, I'll bring an example later. Interestingly, these objects are some of the earliest examples of medieval <coughs> Iberian works of art to arrive at the United States. In 1902, they were a gift of J.P. Morgan, who purchased the bulk, more than 300 objects. It was a very big loot. Of the renowned Catalan collector Francesc Miquel Ibadilla, to Eleanor and Sarah Hewitt, founders of the Cooper Union Museum for the Arts of Decoration, now the Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt National Museum of Design. Textiles like these were the window 
into Iberia's medieval past for the better part of two decades before the arrival of the large architectural units that became prominent museum features. You can think of the Fuente Dueña apps at the Cloisters, of San Miguel, San Miguel de Cuyá, also at the Cloisters and the PMA, so many other examples. Uh, but these really were the first objects that New Yorkers saw, right? Uh, and uh, it's a fascinating story because it takes place during a crucial period of development in the museum history of the United States and the creation of medieval Hispanism in US academic circles. But that's also the subject of another talk. So let's talk about medieval textiles, <laughs> commerce, ritual, and sensory manipulation, which is a growing area of research for me at the moment. My approach to this topic is broken down simply. I begin my inquiry into each object by parting from the premise that a selection was made from a wealth of available sumptuous materials or choices for a specific reason because it best met the conditions imposed by very specific needs. It could be ritual, it could be decorative in the home of the few home decoration items that we have. It's also functional in other ways, uh, but, there, but, but a choice was informed by a need, right? Today's presentation will start backwards, as I said, ending in the 12th century and deterring as often as I can to the 19th century. Art historians today have a huge advantage. This is how I encountered medieval Iberian textiles for the first time. When Gillian Moss welcomed me to the textile conservation department at the Cooper Hewitt, and within a second of greeting me, asked me, do you want to see what silk wrapped in gold looks like? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had called her for an appointment just as I was beginning work on textiles, and I was a graduate student. So I needed to see these objects up close. It was a winter morning. Uh, I think it was like a 28th of December. Um, low light, there was no falling, it was very gray. She had turned off nearly all the lights of the conservation study room, and she led me to a row of microscopes, each ready with a different fragment under the lens. And when she saw the look of surprise in my face, she asked me the question that transformed my approach to the subject. And it was great. It was just sheer joy. She said, can you imagine watching one of these guys walk into a dark room lit by candles, glowing and you know, flickering everywhere? And from then on, the requirement for me has been to approximate exactly how these objects perform in ritual or function in architectural environments or came into contact with bodies or, or were consumed visually by varied audiences. So the question is, what was it about these textiles that met the conditions that the buyers demanded? Admiration and wonderment were without a doubt a deliberate product of the performance of these textiles, whether on bodies or on altar tables. But we have to consider how they achieved these effects. This is how textiles were rediscovered in the 19th century and also in the early part of the 20th century. The wonderment was overwhelming upon sight of their finery. This is a picture from 1968, actually, the last time that Rodrigo Jimenez de Rada, Archbishop of Toledo, we've heard a bit about him, uh, was opened. He was the right-hand man of Fernando III and his son Alfonso X. He was one of the most powerful and erudite men in Castile during the late 12th and the first half of the 13th century. He was regent of Castile, even. And this, in 1968, is when the vestments were removed from, hi from his body, sent for conservation, and prepared to be exhibited at the Cistercian Monaster Monastery of Santa Maria de Huerta, where he was buried. Interestingly, the same textiles were encountered in the medieval and early modern periods in a similar fashion during the periodic opening of the tombs of saintly or celebrated men. In the case of Jimenez de Rada, the tomb was opened nine times between 1247 and 1968, and we have documented detailed and vivid descriptions. The best one is from 1558. 
when Abbot Fray Luis de la Estrada presided over an opening, and I have to say, you know, usually these things happen kind of in the cover of night, kind of heightening the, you know, the mystical dimensions of coming in contact with the body of this celebrated man. Fray Luis uh, commented on the richness of the vestments, the uncorrupted state of the body. He even mentioned of the salt and pepper hair that you could still see. And went as far as to declare that from the coffin, despedía olor de santidad, no? It exuded the scent of sanctity. I love it that all of the senses are involved in this description. It's sight, it's sound, it's smell, it's touch. When the Marquesa de Serralbo assisted the opening of the tomb in 1886 and again in 1907, he combined scientific curiosity, cataloging, describing, comparing, saying, wait a minute, there's Arabic on his clothes. And this is the moment when the Arabic separates the cloth from the man itself. This is the way in which the remains are exhibited in the Museo Serralbo in Madrid today. <laughs> the textile is where the host would be in the monstrance. There's actually two <laughs> monstrances with a textile host at the Museo Serralbo. Super common in the 19th and early 20th century that as these tombs were open, everybody took a big pair of scissors and cut away. It's a big problem for us. Um, so let me move you around in time and try to illustrate the long performative life of luxury textiles and ask you to picture the moment in 1483 when Queen Isabel of Castile, before making a ceremonial entrance into the city of Burgos in central Castile, stopped outside of the city at the Carthusian monastery of Miraflores. She had been funding the construction of the temple where her father, Juan II of Castile, had chosen to be buried. She had come to oversee the progress of construction and to quite literally see her dad. Because she was a woman, she could not enter the monastic space. Instead, she had her father's remain brought out of the cloister and open for her to pray for the salvation of his soul. The chronicle is fantastic because the prior says, you cannot come in, and she says, oh, Father, I would never, ever put you in the spot of even sinning remotely by having me near. Bring him out. <laughs> it, it, fantastic. I'm the queen. Um, intimately, this is how she experienced this moment, right, even though it was not in the confines of a cloister, but it was an intimate moment. Um, the documents described a marble slab being lifted from the burial, from the sepulcher, and the coffin brought outside and opened for her, and the queen falling to her knees upon side of that open casket. And there she remained praying for hours, they tell us, surrounded by attendants and ladies in waiting. This is very likely the bulk of what she saw and came into contact with during that pious visit in Miraflores. Juan II, her father, was buried wearing a spectacular Ilhanid or Mongol Nasij cloth of gold. The reign of Juan de Castile was one, Juan de Castile, that's Spanglish, one of Castile, was one of the longest of the medieval period. It lasted about 49 years, but that's also because he ascended as a one-year-old to the throne. It was not a particularly successful uh, reign. It was marked by constant challenges of authority from the nobility, outbreaks of war within the realm and with neighboring kingdoms, and the power behind the throne was widely thought to be his favorite, Alvaro de Luna, constable of Castile, his valido. Yet the transformation in the public presentation of the body of the king during this period of perceived weakness marked a break with medieval tradition today. From a past of unseen or hidden or mysterious kings, Juan II was very much a publicly seen and exhibited monarch. He was paraded as often as possible. 
It has been argued that with this new mise en scène of the royal body, uh, what lay behind it was a very carefully crafted and deliberate plan. Uh, the aim was to ritualize the promotion of the image of the king to create a visually unbreakable nexus between royal power and sovereignty so as to produce a vision of incontestable authority. And as we know, this power was divinely appointed as well. Now, the exquisite and striking cloth of gold burial, uh, gold burial vestment of Juan II must be interpreted precisely within this context of sensory manipulation that was a key to medieval power displays. The imported luxury item was no good, of course, if it could not perform as needed, period. With very few exceptions, medieval monarchs were buried in the finest clothing available from the royal wardrobe at the time and place of death. A gentle reminder here that the Castilian monarchy did not have a capital city until the 16th century, so it was constantly in motion. The selection of the utmost in luxury and visual impact, red and gold, of course, for the burial of Juan II had everything to do with Castilian ritual and its needs, which was highly visual in itself, with the body washed, prepared, clothed, exhibited, and even paraded publicly to the burial ground, if necessary, uh, over a period of no less than two days. But with Juan II, there seems to be a layer of sensory deception as well, and I suppose this was a trick applied and used by many others as well. Uh, descriptions of the king during his lifetime pronounce him a handsome and nearly perfect man. <laughs> In 2006, his remains were subjected to forensic study. The cartuja was being uh, repaired, and there was a big project of you know, historic preservation, so the bodies came out and the physical anthropologists went in. <laughs> what they found is actually very interesting. Uh, they found a highly deformed man, unusually tall for his time, with an untreated deviated septum due to a broken nose in his childhood that caused uh, facial deformity, so one side of his face was sunken in had a broken scapula from a horseback fall, most probably, so he couldn't really raise his right arm. And he had a sacral abnormality that would have made it very difficult, if not, if not quite painful, for him to sit properly and, and comfortably. No, so something about the, the width of the size of his legs was also rather alarming, I don't know. He, he obviously <laughs> was, was not far from a perfect, you know specimen. No doubt the cloth of gold also helped to disguise a few of those imperfections behind this awe-inspiring, shining luxury textile cut and fitted to best suit the deformed body of a weak monarch, right? So I'm gonna detour back to the 19th century. It is worth mentioning that I came across the attribution of Juan II's cloth of gold in Macari Golferic's 19th and early 20th century textile album, which is what you have here on your left. And this, this is a collection of hand-colored plates, very likely made by the man himself, that kept very precise visual information about works of art kept in textiles, uh, kept in different Spanish and European collections at the time when they were painted. We don't know exactly when he, when he finished it. They seem to have been a study aid, maybe for exhibition planning, which included invaluable written explanations of provenance and collections, sometimes on the back of the image, as is the case with this one, sometimes in front and at the bottom. Golferix was an industrialist. He was a trader of fine woods, is how his family made his fortune. He was an artist. Some Catalan um, documents I've looked at call him a dibujant, a drawer, right? Someone who draws more than anything a collector of Coptic textiles, and a highly visible and active member of the Catalan cultural intelligentsia of the latter part of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. 
The illustrations in this album seem to have been exhibited in 1905 at the Centre Excursionista de Catalunya, a cultural and sporting society founded in 1876, which in 1903 founded Cátedras de Estudio, something akin to endowed chairs, I would imagine, uh, of a Catalan studies in various higher learning institutions around the city. And presently, we're in the midst of researching the place of medieval textiles and textile collecting in this interesting chapter of the Catalan Renaissance of the turn of the 20th century. And this is very interesting because the bulk of the textile collectors in Spain at the time, and certainly its most interesting, voracious, and well-informed ones, were Catalan. In 1901, Golferix commissioned the architects Juan Rubio y Belver, Gaudi's, Gaudi's disciple, to construct a new family home along the new and fashionable Asia Ample. Here is a picture of its neo-medieval textile-infused interior, right? And so Catalan modernism without this rediscovery of medievalism would look completely different. It wouldn't be. But I digress. Let's go back to the 11th and 12th century. Well, my work of textiles began by looking at 13th century Castile, very much tied to the canon of medieval Iberian studies. I have begun to, play, to pay close attention to the 11th and 12th century patterns of textile consumption in the county of Barcelona, a region that has received much less attention in medieval studies, but that has yielded an important wealth of objects and documents, a surprising amount of them still in situ. More importantly, these objects can be firmly located within the orbit of emblematic monuments and powerful characters during a crucial period of cultural, economic, and political transformation in the region. Sumptuous textiles must be placed within the context of the spectacular performance of the Romanesque altar, where architectural innovation, the explosion of painting, and the exuberance of ornamentation with large and small works in silver, gold, enamels, uh, inlays, right, precious stones, you name it, worked in unison to heighten the solemnity of the ritual through the evocation of sacred space. As Manuel Castineiras has argued, the Romanesque altar was a colorful place in which the liturgical implements constituted the visual and symbolic foundation. They also permeated other aspects of religious display. As evinced by these circles, cut from a tapestry weave of remarkable quality, I mean, it is a thick, thick tapestry, um, cut to fit the protruding roundels on the covers of choir books in the cathedral at Vic, and thus prevent them from damaging the wood of the fasistol or, or the, the choir music stand. There are about 15 known pieces. They were all found inside a 13th century manuscript so what is interesting here is to note how textiles trans transformed from luxury items of trade into holy objects as they entered into ritual and artistic or aesthetic dialogue with the ecclesiastic vestments and the iconographic information found all around. But when their useful life came to an end, it was not looking so good, it was too torn, too tattered. Um, when their useful life as large object, objects of cult came to an end, the rich tactile nature of these fine textiles allowed their reuse in new contexts. So it's part of the trick, is we don't always know <laughs> how many lives the objects that we're working with really had. And in this case, it could be as early as the 12th century, maybe even more, we really don't know. We know that it is no sooner than the 13th. No later, pardon. We can also engage the question of the performance of the liturgical ritual through the body of the celebrant, which was a fundamental part, of course, of the Eucharistic celebrations. The burial context of most of our extant liturgical vestments date to the 13th century and some later. We cannot be sure, as I mentioned, reuse was so wide widespread. But we do have three possible examples that survive from earlier periods, two of them in the Pyrenean treasuries, famous Franja del Pirineo and the Tiras de Cois, as well as the better known, the so-called Veil of Hisham II, discovered in Soria in Castile, and now at the Real Academia de la Historia. 
Of these, the veil of Hisham provides stronger evidence of the possibility of its use as an ecclesiastical vestment, as its typology, the almaizar, or veil, may have lent itself to be used as a humoral veil used by priests during the exposition and benediction of the host with the monstrance. Uh, the humoral veil exemplifies the idea that cloth mediated transformation. For the veil, not the priest's hands, is the object that comes in direct contact, in touch with the monstrance once inhabited by the Holy Presence. The possible use of other two examples are more difficult to identify as their fragmentary nature doesn't allow it, that they are tapestry weaves of similar manufacture. The tiras de coes is actually very interesting. It was found wrapped inside, like a little bundle inside a box, a lipsanoteca, uh, underneath the communion ta tem table at, at coes. A lipsanoteca, usually it's a very Aragonese thing. Um, a little box that is encrusted into the wall, the foundation wall of a church, and it has the written uh, information about when the church was built, who laid the first stone, if there were any expansions and transformations. So it was kind of this written history of the building, right? And inside one of these lipsanotecas was wrapped that tiraz. We <laughs> don't know what to make of that. Let me offer you one last example. How am I doing for time? Am I okay? Yeah, great. Uh, it's currently my favorite, actually, uh, because it encompasses nearly all the aspects of our project in a single stunning and very enigmatic piece, and also because, you know, it is 12th century, so that will make uh, Abby very happy. Uh, we are literally just beginning work on this object, so uh, it might seem superficial, but here we go. This is the cope of San Ramon of Roda de Isabena, uh, which is housed in a tiny church, a former cathedral, of San Vicente and San Valero in the Aragonese pre-Pyrenees. Roda de Isabena was conquered by the Count of Catalonia in the year 1100 and took on the role of Episcopal See because the traditional center, Lleida, to the east, was still in Islamic hands. Ramon was part of the first wave of post-conquest French-born bishops appointed to head the Iberian Church, when Carlos mentioned that as well, as that Europeizing push by Alfonso VI. He died in Huesca nearby in 1126 uh, upon his return from Malaga where he had been active in the battlefield despite his old age, as the documents tell us. Very quickly, somewhere around 1136 to 43, he had been canonized and his remains were translated from Huesca, the place of his original internment, to Roda in a wooden box. That's all the documents tell us. In 1170, they were translated again to a new carved sepulcher inside of the cathedral of Roda, which had quickly begun to use the remains of the miraculous bishop San Ramon and those who preceded him. So there was a call to the miraculous presence of bishops, in the plural, as an attraction to enhance the prestige of the cathedral as a pilgrimage site. This was particularly important since Roda's bishopric, as I mentioned, was removed in favor of Lleida when Lleida was conquered in 1149. So it had primacy, then it lost it. How do we retain it, right? Today, Roda is quite literally in the middle of nowhere. It, is, it takes a while to get to it, even today. But in the 12th century, it was located rather interestingly, connecting the Camino Catalan with the Camino Frances, uh, coming from Jaca en route to Compostela. I've heard this called Camino del Salvador. Have you heard that expression that was kind of this ancillary road, Lleida? Haka kind of Huesca. Is that something you recognize? No? Well, we'll figure that out. Um, commercially, of course, this linked Mediterranean and Trans Pyrenean commercial highways, right? So it's far and it's remote, but there was activity going on around it. The Cope is a large textile of the highest quality silk, and I should not <laughs> admit to this, but I touched it. Um, 
I was there meeting with the priests. They've been so kind to us, and I wanted to, you know, we found this, you know, and, and I sat with them, and they're like 700 years old each, and they were so excited. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, he's like, touch it. And he went like that. I'm like, no, <laughs> you know. Uh, touch it, touch it, touch it, touch it. And he's like, it's unbelievable, he said. And it is. It is the softest silk. I don't think I've ever touched something like that. This is an incredibly fine uh, piece, actually. In the detective work that led to last year's uh, epigraphic seminar, which was largely spent searching and documenting a comprehensive corpus of textiles with inscriptions in Arabic and one single one in Latin, we visited Roda only to find that San Ramon's Cope has a previously unnoticed but very long inscription that runs, um, sorry, this is the cathedral as it stands today. It's a little tiny place. The inscription runs bottom to top in the front and top to bottom in the back. <coughs> in the back, the inscription picks up exactly where it lets off in the front. And it is perfectly legible except in the spots where the deterioration of the body, you know, took away a good portion of the material, as you can see here. It was, the inscription was purposely placed there by, I would have to think, an Arabic speaker, at least under the advice of an Arabic speaker. It seems very, very, you know, clear that there was an intention behind it. The cope is white, which is slightly unusual in the European context. For our Iberian corpus, we have nothing like it. Uh, within the European context, of course, we, we do have good examples. Um, the burial vestments of Clement II at Bamberg come to mind, buried also in white from about the same time. Um, this is, of course, a time in Europe where there's no universally formulated rule about the use of liturgical colors. It hasn't been codified yet. In the first half of the 12th century, for instance, Peter the Venerable and Bernard de Clairvaux sustained a long debate on whether monks should wear white, like the Cistercians, and they equated the monk with an angel, or black, like the founding Benedictines, as a symbol of humility. San Ramon had absolutely nothing to do with any of that kind of debate. He was a canon regular of the Order of St. Augustine, who neither lived in a community nor did he take any kind of vows of poverty. I mean, the kind of textile he's wearing suggests that. But what I'm trying to get at, he had a lot of flexibility to work with. The epigraphy, and I'm just showing you a little bit of it, um, and I left it like this because this is exactly the kind of work we have to do. We have to be piecing the images that the priest sends us together and try to, you know, form it and then visit the textile and corroborate and, and all that good stuff. The epigraphy, which is one of the longest, if not the longest, and most just the clearest epigraphic programs of the Iberian Peninsula, reads like a litany, an invocation. <coughs> it stunned us. Well, we were very happy because it was so legible, but it really did floor us. We did not know what to make of it, and we, we read it, and we just stopped. A colleague in the seminar who's a specialist in codicology, and in particular in Andalusi legal texts, suggested that she had come across descriptions of Sufi rituals invoking divine intervention, usually droughts, where the mystic wore a long billowy cape, white and black, and that the description suggested that a whirling motion was performed as the incantations were recited, usually along a dhikr session, or a repetitive, a repetitive invocation of the names of God. I cannot stand here and affirm that this is the case, of course, nor, nor do I intend to. But let's recall that during San Ramon's lifetime, Roda was a recently conquered territory. All manners of good must have been available on its shops, on fairs, even after the Christian conquest of towns and cities across Iberia, we know that this flow of goods continued. San Ramon himself was in constant motion, 
to France and even to Rome between 1116 and 1119 when he ran afoul of the nobility and the king and was exiled from Rhoda. It is very seductive, I think, to think that a Sufi cope of the right size and shape and the right body or on the right body and in the right space could have functioned in a ritually very different way. But again, there is no way to corroborate that. We simply have suggestions. In the poetry of the Andalusi mystic, Abul Hassan and Shushtari, early, well, mid 13th century, especially in his series At the Monastery, the narrator speaks of a Sufi who visits a monastery in Spain. He respectfully greets the priests, praises the sacristan, listens to the choir music. Um, the first part of the, of, the, uh, of the poem is an admonition. And you now you do this, you go and listen to the music, and then, and then the narrator says, be careful, lest they steal your reason. It's too beautiful, right? He witnesses the ritual of the mass, and again, beware of being bewitched. And so repetitiously enters the ranks of the monastic community, seeking the winemaker. Here, of course, a metaphor for God, the wine a metaphor for the conduit, right, to knowledge and union with God. The monks will not reveal the winemaker, and a bartering dialogue ensues. The priest will not take anything but his precious chirka, as you can see here, or Sufi cloak, white Sufi cloak. Of course, a chirka was a mendicant man's rough woolen garment. It's quite far from the finery, right, that I just described to you. Uh, but it was an indication of his renunciation of worldly possessions, of his sainthood. San Ramon's cope was far from humble, but I am drawn to the mutual fascination, the seductive quality of Christian ritual for the Sufi, like a siren song, as well as the desirability of Sufi ritual signifiers, right, his worthiness, for the Christian monk. It's a huge question mark for us right now. But one last wrench. In 1495, the Spanish Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borja, wanted to dress in white to lead a procession praying for the abatement of a storm that had flooded the Tiber. The choice of color was seen as terribly improper in Rome at the time. So I am left to wonder if this type of ritual intercession in white had become an Iberian thing. We're working on that. And then we also have to put the cope in the perspective of the rest of the relics associated with the cult of the same, of the saint, which affirm and reaffirm the epigraphic information uh, in a very uniform aesthetic. And here we have what would have been an incredibly bright blue, uh, very likely Fatimid imported piece. Um, it also has epigraphic information running. Uh, it's hard to see it, but it does have the same kind of um, good wishes for the owner that we saw before. We also have this band as well. Albara coming Allah, Wal Yumna, it's the same exact kind of epigraphic information that we see before. And then this is one last piece again from the relics of the burial of the saint where it's also, right, Albaraka, Wal Yum Wal Iqbal. Um, so we need to put the white cope in the context of all of this as well, right? And, and, and we're working through it. Uh, we are in the process of digging through the documentation pertaining to San Ramon, which survives in the cathedral archive at Lleida. Of particular interest to us is the 12th century Breviario de Roda. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a detailed description of the offices of the celebration of the saints feast day and it does it in rhyme, which I think is great. Um, the guideline for the celebration of the feast uh, is, is, uh, is particularly interesting to us just to get a sense of, of, of what kind of display takes in. Are the relics paraded? How are they presented? That kind of stuff. Um, it is not a particularly beautiful manuscript, so it has not really garnered much attention from anybody, but we're hoping to connect ritual to objects. 
and quite frankly, we're just hoping for anything at this point. Um, uh, and, and, and we're looking at everything and anything as we continue to untangle the threads of the complex connection between commerce, ritual, and the census. Thank you.